last year at the IBM booth in Barcelona, NWC 25. I am honored to be joined by Andrew Coward. Okay, yeah, thank you for the conversation. Before we start, can you tell us about yourself? Yeah, so I've been at IBM four years, and our job really has been to tie applications and networks together so that we get a deep understanding of that. We've now done five acquisitions in the space, and we've got something like seven products in market. How is IBM positioning itself as a leader in AI-driven industry transformation? Because we are constantly in time for it, right? Well, right. If you think about this show, I don't think there's a stand that doesn't have the word AI on it. So there's a huge amount of noise about AI. For IBM, it's about solving real world problems for our customers. And that might sound very obvious. It's kind of what we've been doing for a hundred years. But if you think about it, a lot of the AI stories are really about people saying, I have an engine, I built a model. And if you want to go use that model, you've got to basically build your own car around it. And that takes time and that's hard. So what IBM is doing is saying, we're going to build the car for you. And my job is to deliver products, AKA cars. So we're delivering AI products that out of the box reducing time between resolution of incidents or increasing time between incidents is just the big thing. So massively impacting the networks along the way. What are the key challenges that enterprises face when integrating AI and how does IBM help address them from the perspective of APIs and networks? Well, I think a lot of people think that AI is kind of magic. I'm always thinking about AI as like a genie. You summon AI, it's like a genie. You can ask it stuff, it does stuff for you. Well, amazing, right? Now, there's actually two really interesting powers that a genie has to have if it's going to help you. Kind of qualification questions. If a genie appears in front of you, here's your qualification questions. Like, first one, are you omniscient? Like, do you understand everything about the network the infrastructure? Do you understand where my users are, what they're doing? So do you have that knowledge? Second question, are you omnipotent? Do you have the power to actually go and make changes in my infrastructure, go fix things, go manage things, go make it right, and know that when you do that, you're not making the problem worse. So omniscience, omnipotence, really important powers. So when I've emphasized it, it's not just enough to show up with a genie, or an AI agent. We have to ensure that we're bringing in the right data. And we also have the automation to go push that down and actually make stuff happen. I love the analogy. So what communication service provider need to understand about networking, API? It's really interesting. I think there's been a lot of what I call superficial work with APIs and telcos, meaning they've tried to expose a couple of APIs kind of northbound so that you could ask the network for things like, give me more bandwidth or give me this type of connection. But underneath, it's still a whole lot of people either typing stuff because tickets get created. I'm not kidding. API comes in, people go do physical work or the abstraction or separation networks haven't happened. We acquired a company last year that's given us this incredible power to basically turn anything into an API. So take a process, something that's, we might even sequence of steps or workflow and expose that as a simple API. We're using that to say, here are the really hard parts of the network that you couldn't automate or you couldn't expose in an automatic way. And now we're going to bring that in and drive them through through APIs. And that reset then enables the omnipotence, the power I was talking about, because now the genie can go and say, I want to do this. What, what capabilities does this part of the network have? So all of that then breaks down by the radio part, by the backhaul, by the optical infrastructure, a cloud piece of it. And so you've now got a cross of proper autonomized different bits of your network that you can then go reassemble into new services, new applications. And that... We're seeing opportunities in network management, the changes over the last couple of years, especially now with automation have been huge. Tell us more about that. So we about a lot of the tools today, and I'll give an example. So fault management, but very important part of the infrastructure. So that was always based historically on some piece of hardware failed, a red light came on, there's a fault, go fix it. And now telcos are dealing with a deluge of faults because it's very difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff. So the fidelity of that data as a source of information about the quality and performance of the network just isn't there anymore. So one of the things we realized is that the fault data is just one of many things that need to be looked at 
And ultimately, it goes back to my starting point. It's about the applications. Ooh. Nobody calls up a telco and says, I think the backhaul link might be having a few problems right now. They call back and say, I can't paste on Facebook right now. What's going on? <laughs> so from that perspective, we have to be able to take a query like that. Like, why can't I post on Facebook right now? And figure out where in the network may be a problem. Oh, we're seeing cell site congestion there because there's a football match going on. There's a whole lot of people. Or, but here's the proof to do that. So you have to have almost proof of innocence, if you like, for different parts of the network. And false alone don't do that. So the aggregation of this information is really important across many domains from syslog through IP fix, like understanding packets themselves, and then tracking that back to applications. If you do that, then you get a really good understanding. And then, of course, you can do something about it. We can also go further by stating that we need to further protect our network. We have security breaches. We have cybersecurity attacks. How does IBM help communications service providers on this? Right. So it's interesting because the analytics that come out of a network, mm. they're dual purpose. One is to kind of make the network work better. The other, okay. and the same data, by the way, is used to understand if the network's coming under attack to also have the forensics after the fact to figure out what happened and where it happened. And so as we think about collecting data, a lot of it ends up in security tools, security tools from IBM, security tools from our partners like Palo Alto, who then can look through all this information and then come back with it. Okay, now I know why, and now I know who, and now I know where, and you've started to get your answers. Final words about where can the audience find more information about everything we've been discussing? I, I know IBM.com will be a good source. That's right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we have, let's say, some seven products in market. So if you go to the IBM.com website and look at service assurance, where you look at application performance, or you put a few keywords in around some of the topics we've discussed today, AI networking, you're going to get to details about all this case studies, good examples from users and testimonials, all those things. And of course, uh, reach out to IBM.com and come talk to us. Absolutely. And thank you very much for this time. Your conversation was fantastic, and I am very grateful for that. Great, it was lots of fun. Thank you very much. Pleasure.